What we did was part of our Knowledge Impact in Society grant, we uh, funded KM interns. This is graduate students. It was a competitive program. We funded 12 in, uh, well, actually 13 in 2007 and 12 in 2008. We asked the intern and their non-academic partner, most it, mostly it was community groups, not exclusively a couple of folks worked with government offices, um, develop a statement of work um, and a substantive statement of work. So we didn't want the graduate student just filing or working the phones or doing a database, but doing substantive research with the company. And uh, we paid them to have a summer job. So it was um, a competitive application jointly prepared by the student and the partner, reviewed jointly by a panel of two faculty and two community organizations. Um, and we had a whole rating scale um, based on four metrics, the fit between the student's experience and the company, uh, or the company, the organization, the need, was it really a substantive need, what was the, few, the potential for um, impact beyond, so learnings beyond um, the organization. And uh, we've, uh, so we had 13 the first year, 12 the second year, um, and we surveyed them and said, where are you now? What are you doing? Uh, we found that um, in a few cases, in the doctor's term, lost to follow-up. Couldn't get any data out of them. Um, very, about six of them, six of the 25, their projects ended, and they had no ongoing relationship, and that was correct. Not all of these things need to go on forever. Um, many of the majority, though, still had an ongoing relationship with their partner, and three of them had been hired by their community partner, and that's huge. You know, to have a student now, so the benefits are the student, um, if she doesn't remain engaged, has graduates with um, her master's of whatever and some real, some real experience. So it's like a co-op program out of Waterloo mm -hmm. or, or like a practicum. Um, uh, the, there's capacity building at the community level. So the community partner now knows what, uh, what it's like to work with the university because they're kind of afraid of us. And so there's been de it's been demystified a little bit. And in those um, situations where the student's been hired, she's now working in her field of study. And often that work that she did um, informed her dissertation and informed her thesis and her defense. So it was this wonderfully rich way of, um, of, of testing how we can enhance the two-way exchange between the university and research, non-academic research stakeholders. Um, again, that money unfortunately has run out, so we're unable to offer it this summer. That's the, the game of funding. But what we found is there are three worlds that we deal within. Um, there's the non-academic research stakeholder community, there's graduate students, and there's faculty. I've got to test the graduate students, more so than the faculty who are knocking down our door. Re the, um, graduate students really want to get engaged in this. Yeah. Community is there in droves also. Community, uh, we hung up a shingle and said, if you've ever wanted to work with research, but you haven't known who to call, call us. And that's been really valuable because our research interests don't always align with our teaching disciplines. So we've got Stephen Gates, one of Canada's leading researchers in homelessness. He runs the Homeless Hub, which is an online repository of, um, of homeless research, and he runs a Canadian homeless research network. He's in the Faculty of Education. You'd never think to call the Faculty of Education to find a homeless researcher. So, homeless researcher. <laughs> Many. <laughs> hey, homelessness researcher. <laughs> Um, so there's, you know, so we hung up that shingle, but we're finding that faculty, bless your hearts, who's ever in here, apart from, you know, Nicole, because she's preaching to the converted, are, I wouldn't say resistant, but have not yet embraced the culture change. Graduate students, absolutely. And of course, I'm generalizing. Graduate students are there in droves, finding the um, knowledge mobilization as a way of enriching the experiences. We had, there are lots of examples of researchers who have got tenure based on a, a career of community engaged, community based research. Because this scholarship doesn't replace traditional scholarship, it, it is complementary to that. In my other world of tech transfer, I've never met a patent that didn't have a good publication behind it. So you publish first, you file your patents first, and then you publish. It is, um, this work takes extra energy, but doesn't need to replace traditional scholarship. Um, and, and we just need to have those champions to, to shine that light on that truth, because right now that truth is hidden, I think. So it is really tough, um, and we do find, um, when we're looking at the KISS grant recipients, they tend to be tenured faculty, not untenured faculty. Um, and at York, at least, there is a place in our tenure and promotion system which is um, called professional contributions, I think. And so there is a place where this can be cited, 
The challenge of once you put it there, though, we, as the administration, need to support the evaluation of that. Because we can't just and and we can't just say you know start evaluating it because uh, we don't we don't know how to measure that. But the question also needs to be asked not just of TNP but of peer review, because peer review also the, the needs to um, appreciate and embrace and adjudicate this um, um, alternative or complementary scholarship. And and Shirk has a few pieces of that in the Knowledge Impact and Society grants. There's always non-academic um, stakeholders who are at the peer review table and not as relevancy committees like CIHR uses, but as actual decision makers. The CURA program, do they have non-academics on the CURA review? Uh, yes, but it's, it's all, there's still that tension. There's yep. a fundamental tension between it. So, yes, they do. Uh, CH, uh, CHSR, Canadian Health Services Research Foundation, is based on knowledge transfer and exchange. That's yep. why they were set up about 12 years ago. Uh, 15 now. 15. Yeah. Um, they led a conversation of VPs, academic, and provosts in 2006 to address this question. And then Jonathan Lomas left, and CHSRFs kind of spun a little bit. And um, that, so that conversation didn't go anywhere, but I'm hoping that will come back because we need to ask that question. There's very poor incentives to do this currently. Um, when I was still at Shirk and I had the job of going, and, and this is how Shirk approached knowledge mobilization to begin with. And it's and Michelle, you work in, in the division now, right, at Shirk? Okay, so if you want to add anything in terms of where things are now, um, that'd be most appreciated. But when we started, we took um, grants that were funded under the Initiative on the New Economy. And I went around to the universities across the country, I think we did, there were 15 of them, and talked to the vice president of research and the researchers and the head of the, you know, the, the leads on the various teams and whatnot about knowledge mobilization. And frankly, I needed a bulletproof vest, right? Because I would get shot at all the time, right? This isn't part of what we do. We don't have rewards for it. Da 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 da. da. You're not providing enough money. This is, you know, we don't have specialization in this. This was in 2001, 2002, 2003 that I was having these conversations. What we're finding is that there are places where the conversation is moving, except the conversations in universities sometimes move very slowly, mm -hmm. right? We know this. So why did I start a company? Because, well, last year, my clients took me on uh, 84 trips, right? I did 84 trips last year. Uh, I didn't want to have to fill in a proposal and write, write a... A, right. The only way that I could respond to client demand was to to be engaged privately to be able to do it, right? So that the, the incentives and the structure and the commercial structure to allow me to do what I'm doing um, were best suited to the commercial context. Currently, it's changing, right? Because universities are at least three different things. They're very large corporations, right? Sometimes the largest in the city that they're located in, right? They are a collection of colleges, right? You have faculties and disciplines, and they're a community in and of itself with its own culture and subcultures. And the challenge with this is how do we fit these practices into the culture and the subculture? York's done actually a really good job, but it's had, it, you know, you, you've changed. It's had, it's had you, sure. it's had paid staff, it's had senior leadership saying that this is important. They've seen it as part of their strategic advantage. Right, in terms of attracting other resources and creating relationships. So I think that's, that's part of the challenge of, you know, of being an early adopter of an idea is that you actually have to end up underwriting some of the cost yourself. And that's been my experience as well.